Maddie, thanks for coming on for a chat tonight. How's it going in the Melbourne, more post-Melbourne lockdown now? It's great. We're uh, it's fr- feels like freedom now. So went yeah. went to the pub with some mates early late last week, and uh, it's nice to uh, actually get out of the house. It's it's crazy, isn't it? Like we went out for lunch or dinner the other day, and just sitting down without a mask on, you feel nearly guilty after five or six months of doing that. So crazy. yeah, I think. Uh, it makes you appreciate your freedoms. Yeah, freedom and uh, yeah. So how how you been keeping yourself busy while this whole time has kind of been happening? Well, as a as a dad of a now seventeen month old, I've uh, our, our life's been pretty busy. So uh, my my wife sort of she worked through all of lockdown, so I had him at home really. So um, that that kept busy, um, probably busier than I would normally be out on tour. So yeah, actually- well. Get away, get away for a rest well yeah all the the sleeping schedules will be out all out of whack and just full, full-time full dad like I'm, I'm i'm kind of the same i've been traveling since 15 you know i don't know what this normal life feels like how, how you've been ready ready for it to end ready to get back on tour what's what's the deal yeah yeah very excited to get back on tour it's been um i actually booked flights the other day for going out to play a couple of the new south wales open qualifiers and um just desperate to play something really and and sort of I've been practicing for a few months now and we're able to get Sandhurst was open for um, the Melbourne touring pros for a couple of months. And that sort of kept us ticking along, but after two or three months of practicing without an event, you'd need something to kind of look, look towards to target and mm. uh, so use those as a bit of a, um, an event for uh, just to see where the game's at and then get ready for the Aussie stuff early next year. Yeah, going going back to Santos, I think a lot of people won't realise this, but you know, if you were outside the twenty five kilometre, all golf courses were closed for three four months. Um, you had to get a working permit so you could actually go and practice, uh, bring your own golf balls and everything like that. So yeah, different different preparation than we're normally used to. So you, I, I bet you're rich in to get up to Sydney and have a, have a whack and see where you're at. Yeah, it was um, one one kind of thing that was. Has been good out of it, but I actually able to um, pull the game apart a little bit and work on a few things that if you're playing week to week, you probably wouldn't be able to be able to do. So work pretty hard with my coach, and um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where where things are at when we get back to it. Yeah, well, you never get this time again. That's kind of what I said. I kind of broke my body down. I was like, all right, I need to get to this weight. I need to get a bit fitter. I've got the time to do it. Get my diet sorted out. Um, so now that the golf course is open um, at PK, we can get down there and dig holes and get get it ready for the greenkeepers to kind of fix up. So yeah, in, interesting interesting time. Um, I'm going to target the January events. I think I've just got to been full time studying, so it's not um, it's not as crazy as just jumping into it because I'm I'm sure I wouldn't break par. That's kind of how I'm seeing it. But yeah, how's uh how's the communication going with Japan? Um, we spoke previously about kind of what's going on there you've got full status up there um what's what's going on yeah it's been it's been interesting it's that's kept us busy um through the lock, lockdown it's um unfortunately well japan's sort of been they've been able to play a few events at the end of back end of the year hasn't been they've only played five this year normally there's sort of a few over over in the early 20s events wise but um they've decided to run the money list from this year into next. And um, so at the moment with us not, not being able to get up there, we'll start a bit behind. So uh, that hasn't been ideal. Mm. Hoping we may get a better outcome out of that um, if things go to plan. But um, at the moment, yeah, ho- I'm just really hoping that when the schedule comes out later this year for next year, there's se- what's similar to what is this year and we'll uh, have plenty of motivation to get up there and, um, and, and do as well as we can. Yeah, that's that's kind of the theme of the year. Do the best you can, um, see wherever that ends up. Hopefully, you can get up there and don't have to quarantine because we're we're sick of quarantining. We're not we're not going to sit inside for the rest of the year. Um, I'd love to speak about your journey to the Japanese tour. It's something I'm very interested in. It's a premier tour. It's one of the big three tours to try get on. How did how did that go for you from like an elite amateur to where you are now? Yeah, well, it took me it took me quite a while, really. I, I'd been on. I got to Japan in 2015 was my first year up there, and mm. I sort of turned pro late 2008. So I'd been on tour for seven years, which um, is probably longer than a lot of guys to get get to a main tour. And I'd been close played sort of through the One Asia tour and a bit of Asian tour, Korean tour in the, in the meantime. And I'd, I'd had a crack at 
USQ school. I think I went there four times and mm. missed it second stage four times. Had had a crack at European Q school, got knocked out and just hard those weeks that it comes down to one week and if you're not on, you're not on. So it just sort of hadn't fallen my way and um, fortunately went at the back, was back end of 2014, went to up to up to Q school in Japan and was able to sneak through and mm. um yeah, I've loved it. Loved it ever since. It's it's a great it's a great place to play. Yeah, that's everything. Everything I see, it's like it's it's definitely a place to try get to. Um, if you want to touch on a, a few things about your Q school, you know, experiences. I've I've missed three times on the American Q school, the Corn Ferry Web um, That second stage, that it's just so brutal. European tour second stage as well. I think I missed by one. Um, How'd you get over the line in Japan? Is that was there something you did different? Uh, was it preparation? Was it you know obviously we're trying to just crack into that one percent? It feels like get over the line and get your card. Is it anything you've kind of narrowed it down to or learnt over the years? Yeah, I think it, it was just it was just time and, and going to enough and and probably learning through those experiences and especially the those that US second stage in Europe. There's always a you always see some great players back at that stage. And it's probably, you speak to a lot of guys that have been established on tours for a long time. And they say the hardest week of any tour is probably that second stage, because it's, if you don't get it, you don't, you don't get anything. Mm. At least if you can get yourself through to finals, you get, you get something in the U S you get probably get some corn fairy status or, or what, but um, <clears throat> yeah, it's just a brutal, um, stage and I remember the first year that I turned pro, I, I got straight, I got through to that second stage and missed by one. Uh, and probably coming off that, I, I didn't really, I was gutted, but not as you would be probably a couple of years later by missing that opportunity. And um, yeah, I think it was just experience. And, and finally, I was able to sort of nail one, just got the conditions for the final stage in Japan. It's December, it's winter, it's cold. You, you rarely see it get over 10 degrees for the, for the week. And I uh, just went up there knew I had a job to do and just got down, had a couple of good early rounds and sort of was able to hang on over the long week and was very relieved when the six, six days were done. So. Yeah. So is it, I, I don't know too much about that final stage, but I know it's six rounds. Is it two courses? Um, are you are the same courses every year? Is that, is that kind of the deal? Yeah, it's sort of I, when I went to Q school, it had been there for about four same courses for four years. It's now I moved further up to Tokyo, but yeah, over two courses. There's over 200 players. It's a massive field. You're playing four, so you're looking at six hour rounds. So you add that mm. six days in a row, it's a long, long time. We actually missed a day because of snow, um, which is hard to play. <laughs> um, I had to call it off. Um, so that extended it out a day. Um, yeah, it's no, no, I don't think as, as much as you can say, no one really enjoys um, Q school. I was listening to a podcast the other day with Wade Ormsby, and he said he'd, he pretty much he'd been to uh, European Q school about four or five times and got through four, which is an unbelievable record because um, it's always takes takes really good golf to get through, no matter no matter who you are. Yeah, it's it's just it's just brutal. Like every, every shot has an extra weight on it. I don't, I don't know what, what it is that maybe it's just the tension around the players. Like you get on the range, you get on the putting green. Are you trying to stay with other Aussies or you just, just staying clear of everyone and just do your own thing. Is that, is that something you've done? Yeah. Through that week, we usually stay with some other Aussies uh, you, in Japan that you often have a guarantor who does your booking. So you end up in the same hotels and, uh, I think you need a bit of other company. It gets a long, lonely week by yourself, and especially when you're playing in a place like Japan, where in English isn't the isn't the first language. It's um, you you tend to have six hours by yourself. So uh, one thing I did was make sure I took a caddy because if you don't have a caddy, it, it, it's really difficult for in Japan. Um, yeah, and just it's it's just just gutting it out. I think probably the hardest thing with Q schools is this no real prize money at the end. So it, there's all mm. kind of, you've got to finish in the top 30. Otherwise there's, it's whether you finish 15th or 30th, there's not much difference. It's mm. everyone kind of looks at that 30th spot and is fearful of it. Whereas you probably, your best just to go out there and try and win the thing really. Yeah. I think no, no wiser words are spoken. Just get out there, try and win. If you happen to finish 14th, it's kind of like, well, I got my card. I didn't win, but you know, I'll go home a happy man and 
Yeah, Q schools. I'd, I'll be interested to see what they do next year because I'm hearing categories are rolling for most tours. Eat, like with that, I'm not sure if it's going to be the end of next year or the year after. I'm, I'm not sure if you've heard any news about that. Yeah, Japan are having they're having a mini Q school for guys. Obviously, be only really Japanese guys, so they'll fit them in with the last year's Q school guys. And then uh, I, I guess I'm hope I'm, I'm assuming all tours are hoping that come late next year they can return back to normal with Q schools and so on. But it, it's all going to be a little bit messy for golf. Professional golf's going to be messy for a little while with all until we're allowed to travel freely and all that. It's it's going to be a long might be a little bit bit more of a battle yeah definitely a battle is ahead but you know we've got time it's not like it's like the end of the world we need to do it tomorrow but yeah you're on um we were on a conference call the other day together on the tpc thing we're not going to reveal too many details it's, i'm sure it's confidential you can't be leaking stuff or anything like that but yeah what's uh i, I love you spoke for a little bit about a few different issues um state of play for golf in australia we're both pretty happy of how, you know, the guys are running it. Um, love to hear your take on that. Yeah. I think, I think for everyone involved in golf, it's been a really difficult, difficult time. And um, no one in the golf industry, well, apart from the retailers are, are, are loving it because there's a lot of new people getting into golf, but for the golf professional side, it's hard to run events. We rely on international players coming down to get sort of those the TV, TV going and the sponsorship dollars and, and that's not happening mm -hmm. uh, at the moment. So it's been hard to get our bigger events up. Uh, the guys at the PGA are doing a lot of work to get some smaller stuff up and our schedule to start next year is whilst we're not playing for a lot of money, it's actually probably the best early half schedule that we've had. So if we were able to add a couple of those big events back, then things would be looking great. So um, hopefully come 2022 that's back um hmm. and yeah it's it's just been everything's all sort of there's been a lot of hard decisions have to be made nothing's easy and um i think the biggest thing is all as players and that if we can all there's some new ideas with those tps events it might get some bring some people back to golf and hmm. uh and one of the hard things i've I've noticed uh, through the lockdown, there's been a guy, Rob Williamson, I'm not sure if you've seen it on Twitter. He posts yeah, all these cool, old videos. Yeah, cool stuff. Yeah, really, really cool, yeah. cool old videos of like the 90s or something like like when all the all the famous people were back out there on playing these famous courses, yeah. Yeah, sort of the late, late 80s, 90s, early 2000s. And you just, you see that I'm, he's posting currently about, I think it's the 93 Aussie Masters. And you just see all the, you got some internationals back you, and you've got all the top Aussies play and they, and back when we were growing up, I'm a bit older than you, but watching those tournaments and yet every year had the main names would come back mm. and they probably come back for a pretty limited amount of appearance money. Whereas now you get any up, you've got to pay even our local Aussie guys bit the big dollars to get them home. And they might may then only play one or two. So mm. it is harder to get, the schedule that we had back then is harder, hard, probably harder to achieve now. Yeah, it's you, you kind of see those glory days and when Greg Norman and everyone was flushing it, world number one and all that stuff. But yeah, a few a few things have happened over the years. I think the was it the amalgamation. I think I was a little too young to remember everything with the PGA and the shift across. And you know, I, I miss a lot of those years, and we're kind of just you know dealing with what we've we've been given. And yeah, it's an interesting time ahead. Um, but I think we're I think we're in we're in good hands. Yeah, we've got the right people there, and I think what what they've shown recently is I think that they're looking at creating some being a little bit inventive. And the hard part about back in those times when in the, I guess the glory days we all talk about at the Australian Tour was the PJ Tour European Tour ran from probably February through till October, mm. and they left basically you had November, December, January, most of Feb that other tours around the world could could use, whereas now the PJ Tour is 12 months of the year. So if you're a top Australian playing in, in the US, you, you, you're not really going to come home. You can't come home because you've got to play well over there to keep your job, get yourself mm. up in the, in the FedEx Cup. So it's harder to get people back. Uh, and, and then also people can watch golf every every week on TV, on Foxtel and that and KO and, and those things. So there's more satura saturation in the market and, 
uh, it does make it a bit harder to find those sponsorship dollars. But hopefully with the guys being a bit inventive and creating new things, then we can we can build back up to having a good so- solid Aussie tour. Yeah, I yeah, it's just you got into a lot of good points there about you know they're trying to be inventive. Um, that TPS event that having at Rosebud, I played played Rosebud twice last week. Weirdly, I went down Thursday and played with the the kings of Rosebud, the Marcusani boys. So always a good time. Courses looking unbelievable. I think uh, OCM's had a bit of their hand in it. They have a master plan. It's it's special. Have you have you played it lately at all? Yeah, actually, I played the Pro Am there earlier this year, and mm. back they always used to have an amateur tournament there, so I played it every year, and I, I I love it. It's a great, it's a really good fun layout, especially the back nine. There's some really nice holes on it, uh, and yeah, OCM are there. The old Vic Super Ian Todd's the mm. super there, and the members are raving about the job that he's done, and yeah, so hopefully it's a good time and. Hopefully it's around school holiday so we can get a good crowd down there. And I think it's, it's, it'll be a really good venue for, for that style of event. Yeah. Hidden, hidden gem. It's, it's, it's special. I, every time I go there, it feels like you're, you're at no place else. That's kind of what golf is in my mind. You just you're not distracted by anything. You are just kind of out there playing your game. Hopefully it's a great turnout. Hopefully we can get more people allowed. I think, I think we're starting to ramp it up now in Victoria, but I don't know. We're just waiting for a press conference every day. That's kind of getting pushed out now, but yeah, interesting, interesting time in Victoria. Hopefully 2021's a little bit brighter. Uh, Going back to your like junior days, um, amateur days, any mentors, idols growing up, you know, and anyone that really resonated with you to kind of help you on your journey so far. Yeah. Well, I guess watching those old videos a lot, watching them because Greg Norman was my hero as a kid and, um, that was back in the early days. I really loved watching golf and and going getting out to the Royal Melbourne or hunting to the Masters to to, mm. to watch him and the other players going around. And uh, fortunately in Victoria, Mike Clayton's been a great. He's sort of been the mentor of all young Victorian golfers. So mm. I played with him in a, a Vic Open back in oh, in the mid mid two thousands. And sort of from then on, <clears throat> he was always willing to have a game. Uh, and then also had Paul, Paul Sheehan was a member at Victoria while I was um, sort of coming through the amateur ranks in my early years as a pro. So, and he, he, he was a great, he won a Japan Open, played up in Japan for a long, long time. So he was a, a good guy to get out there and practice with and, and show you what, I guess, the level you need to get to as a, as a professional golfer. Yeah, you definitely, definitely need those idol, idols and mentors to kind of show you a longer sight of view where you can kind of go talking to a, about a couple of things. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, 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 it's good to hear that. Uh, Perth is sometimes so sheltered growing up there for me. It's kind of just, you know, such a footy state, you know, like everyone just loves their footy. That's the, that's a big thing. Um, I, I think you're a, a D's boy. I'm, I'm, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. I am. Yes. Yeah. It's a tough, tough road being a D. These a D's man, but you never be live in eternal. But may actually win a flag at some point in in our lives. So yeah, well, <laughs> maybe the year they've got the lineup. So uh, it's just a matter of them getting out and actually doing it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I've got lots of mates who are their teams are right on the fringe of making the finals, and they're always thinking this t- next year's the year we're gonna we're gonna make the eight, we're gonna make the run, and you just never know. Um, you just never know, especially with footy. It's, a, it's such a fickle game at times. A um, couple of rule changes. We won't get too much into footy, but yeah, it's. Uh, I'm just excited to go. Yeah, I'm just glad that they've gone back to 20 minute quarters. Enough of that 16 and a half minute stuff. Oh, it's so. just a, it's just a sprint. It, it just it doesn't favour the guys who have the bigger tanks. Um, I don't think we got to see, you know, like going like Whitfield, you know, he always finishes so strong, just got such a big tank on him. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing all that coming out of it. Um, one, one question I'd really, you know, really interested to ask you is how you've dealt um, being away from home. You know, we're obviously professional golfers and touring professionals and we play pre COVID obviously, but we're traveling for more than half of the year. How have you dealt with that and, you know, managed, you know, your relationships now you're now you're a dad you know you're gonna kind of got to manage all that as well and you know this this business we're running as a touring professional how how have you done how have you done that so successfully so far yeah i think i'll i'll, I'll probably I'll, i met my my now wife probably when i was about 
about 30. So I had a fair bit of time on the road where I was single and I just enjoyed traveling. And I think the great thing about all the Aussies and, and that is we all get along well. So you generally, there's a big group of you, no matter where you're, where you're playing, whether it's the PJ Tour or Europe or Japan, Asian Tour, the Aussies always sort of tend to stick together. Um, and then sort of since I sort of met, met my wife, I've been up in Japan, which, and that's the, that's one of the real advantages of playing up there is that um, you're only a nine hour flight away from home. You're in basically the same time zone. So that makes life a lot easier. And, and we would in a normal, I guess, normal year over probably playing about, so average around 20 events a year, I'd make sort of seven to eight trips a year. So mm-hmm. up and back and, and Liz, my wife, she's always um, worked, so she's been pretty busy at home. So, uh, and just sort of hanging out with the Aussie guys up there. Well, they've all got young families, which which kind of keep each other. Are they going well? Late last year, when sort of Jack came mid year, made definitely that changed things and, and makes being being away that little bit that that so much harder. Mm. Um, and yeah, I really only sort of had the back half of the year with with him him around, and um, fortunately had played well early in the year, so I could have come home when I when I needed to. And um, this year, going through COVID, I guess will make that going back over next year will probably be a bit harder because I've spent so much time with him that you sort of get used to being home. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, but we're very fortunate in today's day and age that we can. Um, <clears throat> Get on the phone, get on a Zoom Zoom call like this, and 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 you're only so far away. But being in person's that much uh, that much better. But it's always it's just part of the job, really. You got to if you're going to be a professional golfer, you've got to be uh, get used to being away from home. Yeah, you've just got to. It's not it's not the normal life. I think just the you give up your normal, just what it is. You're going to miss a lot of birthdays, friends, weddings, or that's just that comes with it i think if you're ready to sacrifice that at an early age for for the goal or the the thing you're trying to achieve um you'll probably do better you know a lot of people try mix and match i think and yeah it's tough to juggle especially when you're in different countries and stuff like that but japan same kind of time zone i think it is a little different from perth i'm just trying to get my head around the geographical between japan's normally outside of daylight savings it's only one hour we're only one hour behind so um it's not it's that's that's really that's really good um from that that perspective and we've always with my wife we've always sort of looked at it at that yes i'm away a lot but when i'm home i'm i'm home so you're mm. not sort of most most dads are if they're working in the office they're off at 7 30 in the morning they get back at six and they barely see their kids anyway so mm. it's um it's uh well, completely yeah. present. You're just there now. Now, COVID, you've had this time to really put it in. You probably like my. I'm sure we've got a little cat, and he's kind of like every time I go away, he's like, "What are you doing? You've been home this whole time." Like, you're, you're throwing me out of routine. So that's that's kind of how I see it. But yeah, if you um, if you could give a couple of tips for the up and coming, you know, amateurs that were trying to turn professional, uh, rookie professionals, things you've you think would definitely help them. If you got any stuff like that. Yeah, I think it. I, I don't know. I've been playing. I've been playing a fair bit of golf with a couple of the young, uh, up and coming players at Victoria Golf Club, and just trying to say to them, look, you, you've really, well, one before you turn pro, you just got to make sure that you're one of the best amateurs in the country. It's uh, the professional game is pretty ruthless out there, and uh, if you can't generally beat the amateurs, you're probably not going to get out and beat the pros. Um, and there's such a good support system as an amateur as well that. Um, you can use playing those competitive four rounds event, events around Australia and around the world as a really good way to develop. If you sort of turn pro a little bit too early, then you get you can kind of get stuck in that pro am sort of route, which is which is which isn't isn't a bad thing. But it's you're playing one day events and you're not not playing the four round events, which is what we all kind of want to do as pros. Uh, and then it's just ticking. I think for for the kids, it's just ticking all the boxes and getting yourself established. You just got to find, get a really good team around you, get a good coach, hmm. get a good video, get a good program, all those, a, a good mental coach. And because the the thing is that the best players in the world are doing it and they're better than all of us. So if we, if we're not doing what they're doing, you're probably not going to, it's going to be difficult to catch up. So uh, you've really got to, yeah, you got to, you got to treat it as a job. It's, it's not a, 
it's not a hobby it's a job if you if you want to make a living out of it yeah very very well said you know if the if they're better than us why 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 don't we have that around us you know especially if you can if you're going to do it do it right there's no skimping there's no nothing like that so i guess having that team around you is something you've you know and a lot of really good players do to make sure they keeping keep on top of things they keep getting better whether it's you know mentally um, physically golf wise i think that's that's very true in that for sure yeah, I, was, I think, and we're fortunate in Australia, you've got a lot of in, institutes of sports and the Golf Australia programs that they have they have the top people that can get you access. And I was able to build my team up through the years I was in the VIS and I've kept for the, I think I've had the same people around me for about 15, 14, 15 years now. So hmm. uh, if you can find good people that you trust and and that, then people that are willing to put in the extra hard yards for you, then, then uh, it can only be good for your game. Yeah, we're, we're lucky in Australia to have you know, such a huge support system like Golf Australia, VIS in um, Victoria. But yeah, they, they definitely help out a lot of amateurs coming through. They give them the opportunities to, you know, get on that big stage and perform. You know, you see, you know, even Hannah Green and all the, all the guys coming through now, they're really killing it. And it's, it's so great to see, you know, after all these years, you grow up with them and you see them. It's golf's, golf's in good hands right now. Yeah, there's there's plenty, of, and, and you would, and you've been through all of that as well, and mm-hmm. and you know, you, whilst it's all there, you still have to drive it yourself. It's it's not something that's it's just just comes. It's you've actually have to drive the program yourself, and and um, do all the right things to to get the best out of your game. Yeah, have those have those honest conversations. I think you can't just take that for granted. I think that that's huge, especially. I turned, I think, just trying to think, I turned pro in 23. Um, it's about about the age everyone's kind of, I think at the time it was, you're late, you know, everyone's turning pro at 20, 21. It, like that was kind of my my draft class, if you want to call it that. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting decision to make. Um, I think a lot of people sometimes aren't ready for that but yeah that those those few tips there for sure that's that that would definitely help a lot of people um distance debate is something i wanted to speak about bryson he's obviously bogged up he looks i know tv makes everyone look bigger but you know he, he does look massive he's swinging at 130 plus he's really crushing it right now what's what's your thoughts on the distance debate it's a hot hot topic right now roll it back get faster just or do you just need to hit it straight and be efficient what's what's your take on it yeah well i, I think uh, i i think what bryson's done is incre- incredible he's playing within the rules and and to do that to your body is quite a well i hope physically is okay going down the track because it's quite, it's quite an extreme thing to do to your body and he he seems what happened to the masters that he he may be uh may not be feeling that well um yeah and and what he's done is is great he's to be able to play within the rules and do do that, it, all credit to him. But I'm I'm definitely more old school and would like to get the game back to sort of, I guess, having to think a bit more about what you're hitting and having to middle the ball off the face and bring the ball back. So I'm all for oh, I, I, probably like yourself, love love all the old golf course architecture and, and want to be able to play play those courses as they should be played, not with just a pitch and putt and. So I'm, I'm all for rolling the ball back and making the driver head a bit smaller. And, and then the athleticism can still be, you still, you watch those old videos and Greg Norman's lashing at the ball and, and Nick Feldo and all those players are still doing it. So um, that those things that Bryson has done is a bit, will still be important, but not quite as important as they are now. Yeah. I think uh, even if they did roll it back with um, Bryson, he'd still hit it flush because he hits it really straight as well and i think he's an underrated putter people don't give him enough credit for that they just see him smash it now but his, his putting stats are pretty good too so yeah definitely definitely a rollback guy for me i think maybe hopefully they can throw a pro ball in there or something like that so we can we can start playing more of these classical courses you know sandbelt courses because you, you just love to see where they used to hit it the shot the it's not it's not just a chip and putt like i play with these big headed drivers now and you're hitting short irons into par fives and you're thinking, wait, that bunker's there for a reason. It's, 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 it's an advantage right now. Um, it's, it's an interesting time ahead, what they'll do with it. But I think there's a couple of people pushing on the right buttons to kind of 
spark the question at least. Um, mutual friend Clyde sees obviously leading that charge, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Yeah, ho- hopefully we get there. And um, I think a, a new player at, at Peninsula, so one of the best courses in Melbourne, I play at Victoria. And, and, but when you play, it just in your regular comp, you, you, you're barely hitting much more than a nine on or a wedge into par fours and, and so on. And the other thing I think that would be really professional fields are so tight these days. You, you get on a Friday, often the cuts maybe six or seven shots from the lead and rolling the equipment back would actually create a bit of, bit of a distance in the field and and probably bring some of the better players to the top a bit more. It's kind of, it's not hard to be a good driver of the ball now, whereas back in the day, it was a really, it seemed, seemed to be a really important skill. So Yeah. It's, I, I just go, always go back to 18 North at Peninsula and it just, you can see that the normal drive should be on top of the hill. The two, 250 hit a really good drive into the breeze. It lands on top and you've got that amazing you know shot into the, you know, across the mm. club hours are just amazing. But, you know, technology, if I get any breeze off the right or no breeze into me, I can drive it up near the green. And you just think, yeah, what, what a, I'm, I'm missing the, the great shot in. So, you know, obviously love classical courses. So I'll try hit it in the spot where it looks like you should hit it and stuff like that. But mm. yeah, interesting, interesting time. See what they do. Um, it's, I don't know. I think just the, the amateurs just love smashing it. You know, just just love smash and that's kind of leading it. So it's it's a weird. Yeah, and they, and they can and they can they can keep that. That's um, the bit of the argument I don't get is that they people on TV want to people see people smashing it. It's sort of saying, well, you didn't so you didn't like golf back twenty years ago when if someone hits it two hundred and seventy yards and the average is two hundred and fifty, that's still a great drive. Whereas if everyone's hitting it, if someone's smashing it at three twenty and everyone else is at three hundred, well that person that's hitting it longer is still longer. So that, mm. that doesn't make much sense to me. Well, just running out of land, that's kind of, you make a lot of courses obsolete when the ball's going too far. That's, that's yeah. how I, I just see it in my head, but yeah, you'd, you'd love to play a, you know, a 6,000 meter course and think, well, I probably have to hit a six iron and a couple of par fours that are long, but yeah, I think it's just the, once it gets above one 10 mile an hour and you hit something, you know, flush, it just, the, it exponentially goes a lot further and, I'm, I'm not I'm not too sure about what they're testing it at it's kind of like it's a gray area of where they push the limits every year but yeah hopefully it brings back um, pure ball striking and um, managing a game that's kind of that'll kind of bring us bring us back into it but yeah I've I've just over this lockdown period I've, I've gained a bit of length and just thinking in a bit of an experiment with myself and see how it goes see see how it goes I might have, I'm going for a driver fitting tomorrow to figure out why why it's spinning too much now apparently that's a that's a thing so i don't know interesting time interesting yeah, time. very interesting interesting time well maddie been an absolute pleasure love to get to the one question you can ask me anything you like um kind of everyone's been pretty tame so far so go for it well with all your i guess with all your years in latin america i was just interested in the most interesting place and experience you've you've had over there well, I always, I always, always think of this. It's, it's Guatemala is like, just, just, it was on a volcano. Like it was just, I think it was, I think Pete Dye rocked up one day and he was, he was in the clubhouse or in the men's locker room. And he was asking um, if we were walking the golf course because the elevation changed between the first nine holes. Well, the first four went up. It was like 800 meters or something, you know, it's just straight up these hills and, you know, you get your yardage book, it's up 31 on your second shot into the first hole. And then it's crazy. You have to get a, a shuttle from, you know, the tee to the fairway, then the fairway to the, the green. And then it's just, it's crazy. So he, he was really interested to see if we we're actually walking it. And yeah, we, we were walking and they had sandbags on the pass to stop the balls rolling back, back into like, they'd go up and roll all the way down. So well, it's, it's a pretty interesting place on the golf course, but I just, I love the city. Antigua was amazing. Um, I never played well there. So it always kind of sticks with me, but I, I love the city, loved going there. And so many times I joke about, well, geez, I miss the cut or something. I just, oh, that bloody volcano, I hope it blows up one day. I, I'm sure, I'm sure I've said that. And it actually did. And I felt really terrible. Um, and it covered the golf course completely. A lot of, a lot of people, 
um yeah we're lost it horrific I've, I've, i'll get some photos and put them in the links and that but yeah crazy that's a crazy city um a lot of aussies there weirdly i think a lot of people migrate mm. there but that's one that always sticks with me i always like to think about that week because it's i think la, la reunion was the the golf course but they had a um all the outdoor showers in the locker room because it was quite humid you could shower outside and had well it, not outside in the public eye but kind of just inside the locker room under you could shower in the sun it was like really weird setup but cool latino things you always stick with you but i have, I have to speak about argentina i know we've both been there um just eating dinner late you know go to dinner at 12 o'clock you know, go if you go to a pub after that, it's three, four o'clock, and it's just a they're on a different time schedule, eating habits, and yeah, my Ryan McCarthy, one of my best mates, he's uh, engaged to a Argentinian, so every time we went there, we stayed at his house, um, had the very local experience, loved it, hired a car, stayed in really cool places, so saw another side of of that, so I was really quite fortunate on that, and a lot of my friends throughout the throughout the weeks and the years they they either had it was their home country and I was in their 10 click and never had to worry about speaking Spanish and I, I did learn a lot of words and I could understand a lot of it but yeah just just that experience of traveling with a lot of friends I'm still friends with um, was just uh, something I'll never never forget and hopefully when this all settles in the wind or whatever happens with COVID um, I can get back there because it's an amazing continent, uh, even Central America. There's some cool places that I didn't get to see. There's, you know, the Aztecs you know, didn't get up to go to the Inca Trail in Peru. I always went there three times, didn't end up going there. I, I don't know why. You kind of look at it now and you go, well, managing your golf and seeing the city is a, is a tough one um, if you had more time in between events. But I don't know, maybe one day I can go back without my clubs and just, just explore and See, see where I end up but yeah that's 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 what I loved about it all the time yeah it sounds it sounds that those places and I know from playing my early years playing the Asian tour you get to see some different not quite as adventurous as I'm sure Latin America is but and, and just seeing those different places that are, are great and meeting some really good people along the way and it's something special and fresh or golf we get to do unfortunately our weeks are pretty busy so you don't get to do as much of the tourism stuff that you like but it, it definitely nice to go back to some of those places with uh, when we're not playing professionally and, and see them see them properly. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I had a, had a thought the other day about that. If they ran if they ran events Tuesday through Friday, and then you played, well, you started first. You, you got there on the weekend and you played. You enjoyed the city. You, you got to meet the sponsors. You played a sponsors day on Sunday with the sponsors because they're not working, and then. You play your event Tuesday through Friday and then you get to enjoy both sides of it. But yeah, you kind of always give up your weekend, but you're not giving up. You're doing it for, you know, a bigger cause. So you kind of got to get your head around that. But yeah, going, going without clubs is probably the, the answer. I don't, I don't see them moving Tuesday through Friday, especially when the spectators, most of them are working during the week. <laughs> yeah. I, this is all, all different. And I think for the, the smaller tours, definitely there's different ways of running events on, different peak times that are midweek and, and, and being able to give the sponsors the day on a Sunday when they do have their time off. And there could be some, uh, some messy program parties if they're at, uh, if there's no tournament the next day or they're on, on the weekend. So yeah. Uh, well, it, it going, fun. going back to Latino, they always had a, oh, they don't really publicize as much, but like every, every Friday. And I know it was definitely Mexico, Chile, a couple of times they had miscut parties. So, and they were, crazy parties at the golf course so you did you're like nah that's not a backup plan i'm here to play golf that's just <laughs> not a thing and you see some people they really enjoy the city and they enjoy the city and stuff but you're like nah that's it's always always sponsored by heineken or something but yeah fun times get, get some fun. trouble with guys on the last three three whacking to uh to miss the cut <laughs> oh well that's like luckily it's just they did have it's funny they did have um is it Corte that's cut? They always publicize the cut on the ninth and the 18th hole to add a bit of drama. And they have the little grandstand up, little open end things. So, yeah, interest, interesting, interesting time. It feels like yonks ago, but yeah, I'll, I'll go back down there again one day. I'm sure Macro will try roll over there and get some Argentinian starts. So, I'll try back end with him and just to do a cool four weeks or something and we figure it out. But, absolute pleasure, Maddie. Um, I'm sure 
I'm sure we'll see each other in the flesh soon when we're get out when we're allowed guests at golf course because I think that's a that's happening soon. But yeah, not far away. And yeah, it'd be good to see everyone back on tour and actually get get back to competing. Back to competing, do what we're good at. Um, but yeah, thanks thanks for your time and really appreciate it. Cheers, Matty. Uh, thanks for having us.